Welcome everyone. My name is Kathleen Saraza and today I will be uh, running the Crime Busters event coach training since I am the event supervisor for Crime Busters. And I'll start with an overview of what we're going to go over today. First, I'll go over event information and the materials that your students should bring to the uh, tournament, as well as the types of evidence that they'll see and how to identify the fictional criminal that we um, base a whole fictional story around and we'll also go over scoring. So here's an overview of the event. So the official tournament is Saturday, May 14, 2022, and we'll have team sizes of one or two people per school. The time of the event is 30 minutes, and the main objective is to identify the suspect or suspects that committed a PG crime using evidence. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you could ask them while we're going through um, this uh, workshop event. So don't be shy, you can unmute and we'll get through them and get all the questions answered. But anyway, um, more event information. In terms of scoring, the test is out of 100 points, and there are tiebreakers in event in the event that two teams um, have the same score. If two teams correctly answer all tiebreaker questions, the chromatogram quality will determine the tiebreaker, but usually the tiebreaker will break any um, ties we see initially. So we have six types of provided evidence as well as five suspects. And the six types of evidence are powders left at the scene, as well as ink samples, fingerprints, footprints, tire prints, and unspecified evidence. I'll go into more greater detail with these six types of evidences throughout this presentation. As for the suspects, there will always be five suspects that students can choose from. Um, and in terms of how they'll answer the questions, they'll be denoted A through E. They'll, they'll also have given names in the scenario that um, I set up for the event. And suspects, uh, in terms of who uh, they'll say, my apologies, whoever committed the crimes, it doesn't just have to be one person. It can be up to two people, but no more. But it can be one or two people that are the um, people that actually did the fictional crime. And when your students go to uh, the Crime Busters event, there are some materials that will really help them um, that they should bring, such as goggles. They're required for everyone because safety is number one, especially in a chemistry based uh, event. And the materials aren't uh, dangerous, but they can get in their eyes and we don't want that happening to anyone. So goggles are required for everyone, including myself and volunteers. They also need a pencil or a pen. Um, I will have extras on hand, but it's best for them to provide their own. They can also bring one two-sided index card or sheet of notes up to a size of of 8.5 by 11 inch uh, sheet of paper, and they can write on both sides. They also need a magnifying glass for identifying the uh, prints and powders. It'll really help them. And as we all know, COVID pandemic, we do need masks for everyone's safety. And the materials I will be giving each team are as follows. I'll give them a list of possible powders and three different kinds of solutions tap water, vinegar, as well as iodine solution. I'll also be giving plastic cups and wooden spoons and toothpicks to help with powder identification. Same with the black paper. And I will also give them chromatogram materials and rubbing alcohol on top of the evidence that um, they'll be using to uh, go through this event. Kathleen, I have a question. Um, one sure. of the YouTube videos that I was watching about the Crime Busters, it said that when you're identifying the powders, it said specifically do not use tap water to use distilled water. So and I just didn't okay. know. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's fine. Um, I think 
that's true under very like let's say pristine conditions it's best to use uh distilled water but uh i think tap water is also fine too because these are like household powders that shouldn't really react Mm -hmm. like other like chemicals so thank you for that question thank you so much Campbell, could I have you turn off your video camera, please? Okay. Uh, Any other questions about uh, given materials before I continue? Okay. So along with all of the previous listed materials, they also have um, papers that will be given to them. And these papers have the questions that they need to answer so we can uh, grade them so you know your students can get placed as well as uh, a table where they will actually identify the powders and as I go through the different types of evidences I'll be correlating what part of evidence uh, corresponds to which questions they need to answer and there are spaces for where they can fill out their school name their actual names and the team number, but I'm working with uh, the Science Olympiad coordinators to perhaps get their names and team numbers on all these materials to just make it easier for the students. So they just have to worry about going through the event. So first part, powders. The objective is to identify and match the uh, evidence or uh, cup one which contains a mystery powder as well as other powders left by other suspects um, in question of the crime. So they have to match, they have to figure out the identity of the powder in cup one, and it'll correspond to one of the other uh, cups labeled A through D. And the materials that they'll use to figure out the identity of these powders are the black paper, the water, vinegar, and iodine solution. Extra cups will be provided to them and toothpicks and spoons will also be provided to them as well. And this is uh, very important because this is a big portion of the uh, event in terms of how many points are allotted uh, to the overall score. So the whole objective is to look at how these powders look as well as how they react with each of these solutions to figure out the identities. And the types of powders that are available to them are as follows. They can have baking soda, calcium carbonate, cornstarch, flour, gelatin, granulated sugar, salt, white cornmeal, yeast, and Alka-Seltzer. And since there are some combinations that are very similar when uh, trying to react them with the liquids or seeing what they look like, we will never have the combination of Alka-Seltzer, baking soda, and or calcium carbonate within any cup, as well as cornstarch and flour. So um, in terms of these powders, they're going to have certain reactions with the liquids. So in terms of what you can do for your students, Um, It's best to characterize on that sheet of paper what they look like, as well as what happens when we react, let's say, baking soda and vinegar versus baking soda and water versus baking soda and iodine in terms of like any physical changes, as in does the color change, does it dissolve, as well as uh, if it fizzes, um, if it doesn't dissolve. Those are all of the things that they should keep in mind and they can write these notes on um, that sheet of paper. You can also have multiple sheets of paper as drafts, so you can only bring one, but you can always revise that sheet of paper up until the actual event. So I highly suggest you um, make use of that note sheet to help your students. Kathleen, we have a couple of questions that have been written in the chat. Sure. Uh, The first question is, do kids with glasses still need goggles? Yes, and there are goggles out there that are, I believe, OSHA approved. They have to um, fit over the glasses and create a tight seal. You can find them at Home Depot. You can find them on Amazon. Um, So, yeah. We do sell them through our merchandise table as well. Uh, And... um, 
you would uh, be able to try them on, I think, or you can order them and if for some reason they don't work out, uh, they would be returnable. So they could find that in our quick start kit ordering system. Okay. There's another question. Mm -hmm. It says, can there be more than one powder in the cup? And if so, how many can be included? So um, there can be more than one powder in a cup. I have to refer to the rules again, but no more than three, I believe. Um, but that does not mean that every cup will have three. It can have up to. So it just really depends on um, how the test is written that year. And that was the last of the questions? For now. OK. So in terms of the powder section, um, this is the section where they have to identify each powder within cup one as well as cups A through D. Make sure they know to circle the identity of the powder per cup. And like I said before, there can be more than one powder, up to three powders uh, within one cup. They also have to answer on the zip grade um, question form uh, which suspect matches cup one, whether it's suspect A, B, C, or D, and make sure they bubble it into the uh, zip grade since that's what we use to grade as well. So part two is the chromatography part, and chromatography is basically where you can separate a substance into different components based on uh, how it travels uh, through specialized paper when um, wet with some sort of solution. And in this case, we're going to be using chromatography paper. It's very good at uh, letting uh, solutions uh, go through it, as well as any chemicals that are uh, placed on the paper. And in this case, these chemicals are just ink. They're not dangerous or anything. The solution is going to be rubbing alcohol. There are six different ink samples, well, five different ink samples on a chromatography paper with uh, the number two column being the ink sample found at the crime scene. And this ink sample will be matched to one of the other five ink samples denoted A through E. There will be a hole that's punched at the top of the chromatography paper, and the objective is to place a pencil through the hole in the chromatography paper and then uh, balance that pencil at the top of a cup um, so that the chromatography paper hits the rubbing alcohol solution within the cup. And one thing to note is that the level of the rubbing alcohol should not be higher than where the ink samples are written because then that will interfere with how the different um, colors of the ink travel up since um, the chromatography paper is able to have that rubbing alcohol travel up through capillary action. And there's a video, there are videos online that you can um, look up as well as uh, videos on uh, my event uh, website that you could look up on how chromatography works. But the main thing with the chromatography portion is that you have to make sure your students know what to do with this. And this is uh, another aspect of the um, event where students may not be familiar. So I highly suggest practicing them putting the pencil through a uh, chromatography paper uh, punched with a hole and then having them place the paper within a cup of rubbing alcohol so that the rubbing alcohol is right below where the ink samples are placed. And in terms of the uh, answer sheet, uh, really what we have to focus on is making sure that your students fill out uh, which ink sample uh, with the suspects A through D E correspond to ink sample two and they'll bubble it in as question two on the zip grade sheet. Kathleen, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, one says, is there a suggested ratio of powder to liquid? So um, when you analyze your powders, first I recommend that you try and use small portions and just use drops of the liquid. So let's say your cup is half full, 
maybe uh, get a scoop or two, don't use so much, put it on the black paper, and then use um, drops of each liquid that are in these dropper bottles. Uh, we don't want to use too much or else uh, you might end up wasting that portion of powder that you have, as well as not seeing what uh, physical and chemical changes can happen. OK, we have another question. Is the chromatography already, uh, in, in reference to the paper, mm -hmm. already marked with the ink, or do the students need to create their own with pens given? So the chromatography paper will already have the ink samples on them. They're just responsible for uh, putting the paper appropriately in the cup with the rubbing alcohol. And the third question I will answer, it says, how do we access this video for later viewing? Uh, this video will be uh, linked to it, will be posted on the event website. So you'll go to the Crime Busters event uh, page and you will find uh, very soon, with, within the next 24 hours, you'll find a link to this video. Okay. That's all. Thank you. So now we're moving on to parts three, four, and five, where there is a multitude of prints that your students uh, will look at. Part three corresponds to foot fingerprints, part four, footprints, and part five, tire prints. And the objective is to match these prints found at the crime scene, uh, denoted as prints three, prints four, and prints five to the appropriate suspect or suspects, um, suspects A through E. And pictures will be provided of each print type and um, they're not limited to clean fingerprints, meaning that there can be partial prints of any uh, of these types of prints, as well as obscured prints. And that means that maybe uh, there will be some um, kind of smudging that occurred, or there might be uh, some type of like foreign object that uh, doesn't give the full a picture of a fingerprint, but they can compare components to prints that were given by our suspects in this scenario. And this is where the magnifying glass comes in handy. I will try and have extras of the materials, but it's uh, crucial that we equi equip our students with the um, right materials because it might be very hard to um, match the fingerprints if they don't have a mag magnifying glass. And in terms of the zip grade form, and there might be a question. Yes, I'm sorry, I have a question. You said the prints, the prints would be three, four, and five. Those are from the crime scene, and they need to be matched to suspects A through E. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and going off of that uh, question, they correspond to. Uh, the answers to um, three, four, and five corresponds to whoever um, whoever suspects uh, prints matches prints three, four, and five, and they'll answer questions three, four, and five on the zip grade sheet. Part six, this is the unspecified evidence that's found at the crime scene, meaning that um, it's a wild card. Uh, students won't know what the unspecified evidence is until they get in there. Some examples could be hair strands found at a scene, at the crime scene, handwriting samples, pH tests, um, one year was pictures of license plate uh, of the person getting away uh, that was captured by a camera and the suspects gave their license plates so they have to match those. It varies year to year and it promotes out of the box thinking. So you can use the examples and maybe make up some of your own to um, help your students get used to that uh, one part of the uh, event that isn't um, necessarily specified. I have a question, and, Kathleen. Sure. For something like hair sample, it would be a printed copy of a hair sample. It wouldn't be an actual physical hair sample. Is that true? Right. And uh, I should have put hair strands in quotes because I think one year, um, one of the event supervisors, they actually use not hair strands, but let's say cotton that was stretched out really thin versus those, I don't know if it's cellophane, but you know those brightly colored foil um, decorations? 
um, confetti, things like that. So it's supposed to simulate hair, but it's not actually human hair. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And on the um, sheets given to them, they're going to answer uh, whoever's um, unspecified evidence sample suspects A through E correspond to evidence uh, six, evidence sample six. Part seven, this is also a very important part of uh, going through the Crime Busters event. So using all of the answers uh, from parts one to six, they're going to implicate one or two suspects. So they're going to see out of all these questions, um, what are the most, I guess, answered letter, right? And based on that, they're going to say who committed the crime. And that's when they can fill in one up to or up to two bubbles to implicate, let's say, suspects A and D committed whatever crime was uh, written in the um, backstory. So make sure they answer that question too. There are tiebreakers because with the amount of um, schools participating, there's bound to be uh, pairs of students that end up um, scoring the same. And these tiebreaker questions are provided uh, at the end of the test, it varies year to year. And if two teams are tied and then they answer both tiebreaker questions or all tiebreaker questions this, uh, correctly, then their quality of the chromatogram will determine the tiebreaker. So I guess uh, what to do when they're finished. They should do double check their answers and make sure that they answered all the questions in terms of circling the powders on that powder chart, as well as filling out all the questions on the zip grade. Um, they should also write their name on the chromatogram if there is no uh, denotation of uh, their team number, though we're working on getting the team numbers on the chromatography papers assigned to each group but just to make sure because that's very vital to their scoring as well as any ultimate tiebreakers if it comes down to it. If they finish early, they can raise their hand and then myself or one of my volunteers will collect their materials and make sure that they answered everything correctly. If they finish at the 30 minute mark, I'll be um, giving an announcement like, hey guys, uh, the uh, time allotted is done let's turn in your materials and they'll either, either give them to me or one of my volunteers, like always. And here are some final notes. You can check out the website for Crime Busters at using this link. And again, this presentation will be distributed um, very soon after uh, uh, this presentation. And the objective is to start practicing early, not only trying to identify how these powders um, react with the div different solutions and how they look or how to do a chromatogram, but they should practice splitting up the work, especially if it's a pair instead of just one person, because I have noticed that throughout the years, uh, pairings that, uh, have a plan on who's going to do what, like let's say student one will focus on the powders while student two will focus on the fingerprints, they end up performing better or at least uh, they uh, have a better sense of what to do. So I really recommend practicing how to go through the event as well as assigning which students will do um, what part of the test. Also ensure students have all the materials before the tournament. I'll try and have extras, but it's very good if they just come in prepared with everything they need. Use the student's note sh sheet to their advantage so uh, they have the best chance of performing well and most importantly, have fun. I've always found chemistry fun and I like sharing it with other people. So I really hope that uh, your students find joy in um, doing all these uh, different uh, chemical, um, not processes, but basically doing chemistry is, is what I'm saying. There is a Crime Busters workshop and maybe a question. 
Uh, there is a question, uh, but let's keep 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 going and we'll get to it in a minute. Sure. So there's a Crime Busters workshop on Saturday, February 5th, 2022, and there are two different sessions. One's from 10 to 11 and the other is from 11.30 to 12.30. It's at the MISD building in the big auditorium they have. This is the address. And basically this is going to be an, a hands-on experience for your students to um, go through the different portions of the Crime Busters event, powder identification, making a chromatogram before uh, the practice tournaments. More information can be found at this website. And there are three different practice tournaments that are tentatively scheduled. I believe the schedule can change depending on um, many factors, but these are the dates uh, that are stated right now. And Chippewa Valley's practice tournament, March 5th, South Macomb uh, School District's uh, March 12th, as well as Utica, March 22. This is going to be a practice run through of the event with uh, the same materials. Um, there's going to be those papers given to them and a fictional uh, crime um, detail through a paragraph at the beginning of these um, test papers. And uh, they have a chance to go through a practice session before the actual tournament. I highly recommend if you haven't uh, signed up for one of these already to sign up for one. And you'll see me at most of these. I'll be the one running them. Um, more information can be found at this website. I'd like to comment. I, we've got at least one question in that regard. Sure. Uh, if you go back to the practice tournament page, uh, each team in our tournament who's registered every registered team is invited to one practice tournament and one tournament, only one tournament. So you can't attend more than one. Uh, your team will be contacted by the respective tournament director. So if you're a Chippewa Valley team, you can expect to be contacted by Samantha Boss. If you're uh, the Utica in the Utica district, you can be expected to be contacted by Renee uh, Fema, the uh, principal at Messmore. She's the coordinator for that district. All other teams, will be contacted by the South Macomb tournament director and we'll get an invitation. No one will be left behind uh, and ev everyone will be invited. Those dates are pretty solid. I'd be shocked if they changed. Okay, thank we have you for the update. We have another question. Uh, it's as Jessica is asking, is this an appropriate meeting to ask about team A versus team B? And I guess it depends on what your question is, Jessica. So if you could let um, us know what that is. Sure. So my niece is participating and I'm the event coach for Crime Busters for her. And I was reading on the Macomb Science Olympiad page about Team B. So then I started wondering, well, which team is my niece on? I contacted her, the teacher that's coordinating, and she said she's on Team B for all of her events. Well, so then there, I remember. So what when we refer to team A and team B, we also, the names we use for those teams is a primary team and a second team. In schools, a, a small number of schools have registered a second team. The mm -hmm. choice of which team the student participates on is the decision of the head coach primarily, or maybe exclusively. And that, that process is unique to each school. We as a, as a tournament don't get involved in those choices. Right, students, and, and that, I'm sorry. Students are not allowed to compete on both an A and a B team or a primary and a second team. So um, if all, it's not surprising that your niece's events would all be on the same team because that is mm -hmm. a rule that we have that mm -hmm. students are not allowed to cross over. Right. And, and I understand all that. I'm fine with that. My question is, um, since she's on Team B, I read something further that Team B or secondary teams can participate in the practice tournament but not in the actual May tournament, but they can attend and sit in the spectator seating and that's, um, th participate that's not, in the- So that's not, that's not true. What school are we talking oh, about? Uh, Edison in Fraser. Edison, Edison. so Edison, Edison has registered two teams and okay. every, every registered team can compete um, okay. in the, uh, the practice tournament, which in your case would be South Macomb, uh, mm -hmm. Those those two teams will compete head to head uh, okay. in the in the practice tournament at South Macomb. It's a little bit different at the Macomb tournament in May, 
Um, okay. We have uh, the uh, the Edison primary team will compete in the K6 division, mm -hmm. and the Edison second team will compete in what we call the second division. And so in okay. that tournament, they won't compete head to head. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here about crime busters. Sure. <laughs> uh, we've got several. Uh, one says, "Can a magn can magnifying glass have a light?" So I'm not picky about that to be honest as long as they have a magnifying glass that's fine if they come in with a a microscope though that's completely different but magnifying glasses with lights are perfectly fine we said another question are also are there restrictions on strength i think we're referring to the magnifying glass still or power or size of the magnifying glass yes so in terms of like the magnification, like there's some are 10x, some are 30x. Does it matter? Do you? For me, it does not really matter. Um, what I might find useful for students is if there's two different magnifications. Like there's, um, if we look at a magnifying glass, there's that big portion that you can usually look through. And then there's a smaller circle within uh, the big circle where it can magnify further. But I don't have any restrictions on that. We have another question. It says, can you go back to the powder page? You gave a sure. list. Then you said there are a lot that act the same. Then you have a no list. Does that mean it won't be these powders? So I think we're looking for more clarity about what powders can be combined with others. Yep. So these are the combinations that will not occur in any of the tournaments. So the combination of Alka-Seltzer and baking soda or Alka-Seltzer and ca calcium carbonate will not occur as well as baking soda, calcium carbonate, uh, baking soda, Alka-Seltzer, any of those combinations will not happen as well as cornstarch and flour. So you'll never see either um, a combination of any of these uh, powders or these powders within a cup. But otherwise, you can have a baking soda and gelatin uh, sample within one cup, for instance. You can have just one sample within one cup, which is cornstarch in the end. And in terms of uh, how you determine that, that's going to be based on how well the students can um, identify these powders using uh, both how they look. Um, using the black paper or within the cup itself, as well as how they react with different solutions. Did that clear up the question? Well, let the person ask again if, if it's not clear. Sorry, um, yeah, that kind of cleared it up, whatever. So you're saying that, so it's just the combinations that won't be happening, not mm -hmm. that, it, but it could be individual or, with some other combinations what you're saying yes okay um and you said there's sorry and the way of testing it is through solutions that we that you'll have, give us right uh in the event yes so they'll be provided with water vinegar and iodine solution and i do believe there are um startup kits uh that are also distributed through a uh, science olympiad that's also on um, the Crime Busters webpage that you can look into get. Okay, because yeah, we we literally just started our group whenever yesterday, so we. <laughs> well, <laughs> like congratulations! Beyond, thank you. Yeah, I'm so a little beyond confused. Um, and so he said the same thing with the papers or whatever. That's all. As I said, it just went a little quickly or whatever. So, the paper things or whatever, we're putting a pencil on, and. and so, me. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're just, fine. You're fine. Um, chromatography is what you're talking about. And I'm sorry if I use uh, maybe terms that aren't like as clear because I'm a trained chemist. So think differently about these things sometimes. But anyway, there's going to be a basically some uh, form of filter paper. That's what chromatography paper is. And it's just thicker paper that allows it to get wet without breaking apart um, compared to like normal paper. 
normal okay. paper. And it's going in the event, there's going to be six different lines on that uh, filter paper where there's going to be one line that corresponds to the evidence found at the scene, scene which is denoted as two, as well as the other five uh, ink lines denoted as um, ink line belonging to suspect A and so on and so forth for the other four suspects. And the objective is, since there's going to be a hole punched into the filter paper, they're going to take a pencil and put that pencil through the hole so that it's going to be in the middle of that pencil. After, they're going to balance that pencil um, on the rim of a cup that has rubbing alcohol in it. And the whole objective of this is to make sure that they set up their um, chromatography paper right so that it um, gets submerged into the alcohol enough to start having the alcohol travel through the paper without um, putting it in too far. Because what I see sometimes is that students put the paper below the um, liquid line of the alcohol and that screws up how the different parts of the ink will separate because they'll see that even if all the ink samples are black, let's say, uh, as the alcohol travels up through the filter paper, they're going to see that maybe the black ink actually splits into like purple that can occur closer to the um, where the ink sample was set. And then they might see some greens or blues that make up that black color since black is actually a combination of many different colors. Alcohol provides uh, students with the ability to see like what different ink colors make up that black ink. Kathleen, do you as a supervisor put the alcohol in that cup in advance or are the students pouring alcohol into that cup? So we put that alcohol in the cup in advance. We have several other questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, one says, I know the video is being recorded. We'll have access to that. Will we be able to uh, obtain a link to the slides as shown? The answer is yes. Uh, uh, now, this is a question in regards to what the students can bring into the event. It says, can note cards also include photos or just notes? Note cards can include photos, either handwritten or printed on there. Um, but it has to be printed on there, meaning that there can't be, let's say if we have a sheet of paper, there can't be like uh, pieces of paper taped on top so they can write on that smaller sheet of paper and then lift it up to see more on the bottom. So it has to be all within the sheet of paper, no external appendages. Um, and it's not, it, it can be handwritten or printed. Good. Uh, we have a clarification question on powders and it says so they can have sugar and salt in one cup. Yes. Question mark. The answer is yes. How much part another question, how much participation or guidance is allowable from the coach during the tournament? I can tell you absolutely zero. You will not be allowed into the event room in any of your events. Uh, this is strictly the students showing what they know how to do. Uh, sorry, Kathleen, I couldn't resist answering that question. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Will the salt at the event be as the same as the salt in the kit? And I, I'd like to put a clarifying question to you, Kathleen, on this. I know sure. that when we purchase salt for the kit, we purchased non iodized salt. And I know that you can go to the store and purchase iodized salt as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, properties of salt. You can have iodized or uniodized, but um, basically, I'll get into some chemistry here. Salt is a substance in which where you put um, water that's a polar substance, it's just going to dissolve right away because it has uh, the properties to dissolve right away. Even if it's iodized, it still has um, the overall uh, base property of dissolving um, when put in water. And the same properties are going to apply when you uh, put iodine or when you put vinegar on salt too. So uh, you can get 
iodized or unidized, but they're still going to act the same. Uh, this is in regards to chromatography. Someone would like to know what size the cups are. So uh, the size of the cups, um, for us, they're going to be solo cups, and I tell uh, my volunteers to not fill them too high. If they end up still being filled too high uh, to the point where students can't get the uh, chromatography paper position so that the ink doesn't go into the um, alcohol, then they can raise their hand and will adjust the level of alcohol accordingly. Conversely, if it's not enough, they can raise their hand and we'll put more alcohol in there too so they can um, do the chroma chromatography correctly. So here's a question. It says, would the chromatography paper test be used to identify the pen used to write a note found at the crime scene? So um, it's not identifying, well, by proxy, it's going to be identifying the pen, but it's more the um, ink sample that's found. So in terms of the scenario, it's like we found some sort of uh, note, but Mind you, this is like a uh, fictional story, and I guess there's only so much we can do to like justify how we found the ink samples. So in so, real so world, I think it's more involved. The, it might be part of the story. Like yeah. the story might say, hey, we found a note at the, at, the, at the scene of the crime, and now the chromatography paper has that sample on it, and you're going to get to compare it to it. Right. Another question. It says, as far as the powders they're looking for and how they look, let's say I better read this. This is a little wandering. How they make the different uh, This is a question asking for the different kinds of information or different kind of evidence that you can find by reacting the powders with the liquids. And, you know, uh, they're okay. looking for how they look, how they react, how they, whether they color change, whether they fizz. Uh, it sounds like so, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's for you and your students to explore because uh, I, I don't think I can give like all the different reactions of like how they uh, interact with the different solutions as well as how they look. So this is a good chance to, you know, really dive in deep on to how to uh, analyze powder samples in this case. Uh, so we're focusing on in terms of uh, chemistry topics like uh, physical appearance. Um, I don't recommend smelling the powders. I can tell you that uh, we don't want any powders going in anyone's noses, but you can see how they look, uh, compare maybe one's more white than the other, as well as how they react with water, vinegar, and iodine solution. I've seen um, students that have note sheets that have a table on, okay, uh, one row is baking soda, and then the three columns are water, vinegar, iodine solution, and they write what observations they see. So that might help with how to set up your um, note sheet, but I can't give you all those uh, different um, reaction parameters, let's say. We have time for one more question before we have to wrap up. If somebody else has a question. And I don't see any. OK. Well, thank you so well. One more question. Can you hear me? Yeah, All right. I tried to type it in the chat, but it's not coming up, I guess. Um, can you go back to the workshop slide real quick so I can write down the date and stuff? Sure. And uh, here it is. And we'll also have these slides uh, posted too. So any uh, other info? Yeah. There are links to this workshop on our elementary homepage as well. Uh, there's multiple ways to find this information if, if you lose track of this one.
and the workshop one that's for the the leader or is that actually for the kids to learn the things it's for both the students and their event coach we are constrained on the attendance in that room and so we're going to insist that it only be the event coach that accompanies the students uh, we don't we unfortunately are uh, won't have space to accommodate uh, other people tagging along gotcha thank you Thank you, Kathleen. Let's okay. wrap. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone with their questions and for coming today. I hope you have a good day and I'll see you throughout the season. Good luck preparing. <laughs>